exciting. The content of this, yes, got it. Okay, setting up. Yeah, so I think we are live. I don't see myself on the um on YouTube, but maybe it's because it's my account. So let's start. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the Business History Conference book series. My name is Paula de la Cruz Fernandez and I am the BHC's website and digital editor. Today, March 1st of 2024, is the first of our live streamed book interviews. Uh, for more, check out the book, the BHC's book series calendar on the website, thebhc.org. This interview is being live streamed on YouTube and I am also monitoring um, the chat there um, in case there are any questions coming that way. And the video will be available on, you, on our YouTube channel after the interview is over too. Today I have the pleasure to host Dr. Zach Frolick, who will talk up to us about his book From Label to Table published by the University of California Press. Zach Prolick is an Associate Professor of History of Technology at Auburn University. His research focuses on the historical intersections of science, law, and markets, and how the three have shaped our modern, everyday understanding of food, risk, and responsibility. He has a PhD in Science and Technology from MIT, and has lived and taught in many countries, including Spain, South Korea, and Austria. Froelich's book, From Label to Table, gives a biography of the food label, tracing policy debates at the US Food and Drug Administration from food standards in the 1930s to informative labeling in the 1990s, including the nutrition facts label found on American food packages. Two other business historians and experts in the history of technology, brands, brand, material culture, and the census in US history are here with us today. Dr. Jennifer Black is a historian of visual and material culture with a particular focus on the late 19th, 19th and, eight, and early, earlier, early 20th century in the United States. She holds a PhD in American history and visual studies from the University of Southern California, as well as an MA in public history and a BA in art history from Western Michigan University. Her research, her research examines ways in which people interact with images and objects and the power of visual and material culture to influence trends in politics, the law and society. Her recently published book, Branding Trust, Advertising and Trademarks in 19th Century America, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press just this year, 2024, traces the development of trademark-centered advertising in the U.S. from the early 20th, 19th century through 1920. And we also are um, accompanied by Professor Arwen Mohan, who is a historian of technology, capitalism, and gender. She's best known to BHC members for her 2013 book, Risk, Negotiating Safety in American Society, which won the Gomery Prize. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her other books include Steam Landries, Gender, Work, and Technology in the United States and Great Britain, 1880 to 1940 published by John Hopkins University Press in 1999, and The American Imperialist, Cruelty and Consequence in the Scram Scramble for Africa, which came out uh, from the University of Chicago Press this past November, 2023. Her current research on the changing smellscapes of mid-century American takes her ongoing research interest into the history of the census. Arwen, teaches at the University of Delaware, where she is the Henry K. Reed Professor of History. 
She is also the immediate past president of the Society for the History of Technology. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Great to be here. Great to be here. Yes, thank you for having us. I want to start the interview by asking uh, Shaq to tell us a bit more about himself and um, how do you became a historian and also how did you become a historian and also a little bit of, of background about the book and how um, did it all start? Yeah, happy to do so. I'm really happy to be here. Very grateful to Paolo for all her work. I consider BHC to be my community, so it's really exciting to be part of this uh, new series and help uh, bring out this new opportunity for authors in our in our community. Um, I got into history. So when I was an undergraduate, I was a science major. And um, I, I think the real, both the origin of some of my interests in the topics in this book and also my interest in history started in a study abroad experience when I was living in London. Um, and I got interested in how people talked about food there differently. Uh, I think it's a common thing when you live in a study abroad culture, there are these little differences that suddenly you notice between your own culture and, and your host culture. Um, it, it kind of, it reminds me of uh, Arwen's work on vernacular risk cultures. One of the things that really fascinated me is my flatmates were Muslim. They were first generation British, but from Middle Eastern and, um, and Pakistan. And I would ask them, you know, how do you know something's halal since you're living in this non-halal community? And they would have all these interesting different strategies of how they would handle that question. Um, and so it got me interested in this kind of comparative cultural questions and also um, sort of everyday ways of handling food and risk. Um, and I also was interested at the time, there was a big debate about genetically, um, genetically modified foods in Europe and not in the United States. And so I was that actually, I came back to the United States, switched majors from biochemistry to history, and that became my undergraduate thesis was, you know, why is there a debate in Europe and why is there not a debate in the United States? Um, so that continues to be something I'm interested in. I really like finding everyday things and then asking the question, what's the sort of story behind them? And that's one of the things I really hope this book does is sort of take something that's familiar like the nutrition facts label and then says, actually, there's a lot more complicated stuff behind the scenes on that. Um, the book itself got started in a kind of similar way where it was a conversation with a European friend. I was uh, had a friend visiting me uh, in the United States, probably around 2004, 2005. Um, and at the time there was not a similar nutrition label in Europe and she was looking you know, she was in my kitchen looking at food products. She picks up a package, looks at it and says, this is so American. Um, and, and we kind of laughed, but actually I think she was picking up on some interesting things. Uh, it, 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 we didn't talk about it specifically at the time, but I suspect it was, you know, partly this legalistic culture that Europeans imagine we have where, you know, we would put warning labels on banana peels saying, don't slip on this. Um, they, they just think of us as like this court culture that's constantly suing each other. Um, and also that it was the weirdness of something so uniform and consistently the same and all of these different products um, also seemed very American to her. And then the other is that we have a notorious diet science fad culture where, um, there's constant sort of interest in new ideas about science and diet, and this changes what people eat. And this is becoming true in Europe, but I think for European, especially then, it seems very sort of American to not have a sense of what to eat. You know, like in Europe, we know what we eat. We eat what we traditionally eat. And so this got me interested in kind of what is the story behind the nutrition facts label. And it started off just as a kind of look at the 1990s. But very quickly, I discovered there was a lot more going on than just the classic story of there being a push in the 80s for legislation. Um, there was this 1990 legislation, the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, and then the FDA created the label. Actually, it was clear that the FDA needed the label to do a lot more because of a decade-long uh, problem with uh, food labeling. So that's sort of how I got into history and also uh, how this sort of book began as a, as a project. Any of you would like to start, Arwen or Jen? 
Yeah, thanks, Zach. This is, it's such an interesting book. And I love that you take something that is, you know, in the United States, it's such a ubiquitous object, right? The food label. And you really unpack the the backstory of this. And one of the things that I found really interesting is um, in my own work, thinking about the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. And, and if we have time, maybe we can talk about how that really kicked off part of, of the story that you're looking at here. But I think I wanted to first start by asking you, I mean, one of the the arguments that I think you make in the book, which is really interesting, is that food labels tend to regulate markets, that they have a, a role in the regulatory apparatus, and that it's the nutrition label or the food label on product packaging that helps to regulate the market. So can you talk to us and the audience about how does that work? Yes. So when I got interested in the nutrition facts label, I was coming to it as a science study scholar. Here you have this language of thinking about food nutrition um, that's suddenly now in every food product. And part of the story that I told when it was this was a dissertation project was how you go from a moment in the 1950s where no one's talking about saturated fats or carbohydrates to a moment in the 1990s where now it's just ubiquitous. Um, so I saw the nutrition label as part of that science story. But when I started looking into why the FDA was interested in the label, I realized actually consumers reading the nutrition label was only part of the, the story. That uh, food labels play a really important, particularly in food law, as a kind of infrastructure. Um, in the book, I, I move between it being a market infrastructure because businesses are also really using the labels to do a lot of stuff logistically, but also in terms of branding and, and advertising, but also a legal infrastructure um, because often the FDA doesn't have the power to go into the factory and see what people are doing. And so the, the label became a kind of legal accountability device. Um, what you say on the label is something that the FDA can then challenge you on and and say actually this is not true either because it's not it's genuine fraud or because it's not true because it's misleading on what on the spirit of what the FDA is seeking. And in that context the nutrition facts label is important um not just because it's being read by consumers but because it's shaping a lot of the rules about what industry can and cannot say um what is considered uh, protected uh, there's this phrase that I never know how much people know this, but it's really pop common in legal thing, puffery, right? The kind of uh, outlandish claims that people can make like the best coffee in the world, which is protected and legal and understood to be like, you're not going to, if you deceive a consumer on this, that falls on the consumer's responsibility versus the healthiest cup of coffee, where suddenly the FDA's public health concern about what is a legitimate claim or not uh, means that it can come in and say, actually, you can't use the word healthy on this. Great, thank you. Um, so I can follow up on Jen's question about how food labels regulate markets by asking uh, about how they've changed what we eat and how we eat. And I was particularly struck uh, by a passage in your book where you talk about how the introduction of the nutrition facts label forced, um, well, I'll quote, dramatically altered America's food supply and choices at the supermarket. Faced with mandatory universal label, American food companies began reformulating their products to avoid startling their loyal customers. Um, so can you tell us some more about some specific examples that the audience might be familiar with of foodstuffs that were reformulated because of the nutrition panel or disappeared off the market? And, and more generally, how that panel has changed uh, how Americans eat? Yeah, so, so that particular claim started because I was interviewing people who were active in the 1990s with the nutrition facts label. Um, one woman I interviewed, uh, Regina Hildwine, who had worked with the Grocery Manufacturers Association, um, sort of just told me that it took 
three years for the FDA to develop the new nutrition facts label. And she was like, during those three years, the food industry was reformulating its food products, aware that with the change, some of their products were not going to look good. Um, I can't tell you specific branded products, but I can say, for example, that uh, baked goods that had high amounts of saturated fats, they were trying to find ways of bringing other sa- sat- other kinds of fats uh, to do the same kind of um, sort of soft, flavorful feeling. Um, this had some unintended consequences that became visible about a decade later because one of the fats they used were trans fats, um, which would be labeled polyunsaturated fats before the FDA introduced the trans fat label. Um, sodium, lowering the sodium on a lot of products was another uh, concern in, in chips and, and other kinds of foods or, or uh, ready-made meals. So it had, so it was one of those things where um, I also had a, a friend of mine who was an FDA historian, uh, Susan Junode White, uh, sort of said, yes, actually when the legislation was being developed, I grabbed a bunch of food labels on products to be able to then compare them afterwards. And so she also said, yes, there was, there were clear changes in, in uh, some of the cereals and other products that she had grabbed. What, what interested me about this, it goes to this question about how labels regulate markets. Um, when I was giving talks about my work on the food labeling, I'd have, you know, I have some audience members who are really interested in this. Like, how, you know, how does this work? What is on the label? But a lot of the audience would ask me this question, do people even read them? And this, I got this question so much that I was like, I'm putting this in the introduction to the book because it's a great question. And it's one that industry spends a lot of money on trying to figure out, like, do they read them? Who reads them? And how well do they read them? But one of the sort of themes that I talk about throughout several points in the, in the book is how even if you're not reading the book, when there's a change in the label, it changes the food you're eating. Because since industry does reformulate these foods, the food you ate before and after has changed. And so I made this point that the the regulatory effects go beyond sort of the consumer reading the information, but are there um, on the kind of backstage of production. And I think that, I'm sorry, Arwen, go ahead. Go go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that raises an interesting question, Zach, about how how experts are imagining consumers, right? Are they understanding consumers um, as as being very astute, as as reading the label? Are they understanding consumers as developing their own expertise? Or are the consumers ordinary or unwary? You know, you have these really uh, great descriptions of the changing legal framework in how consumers are thought about in in the law over time, but also how experts are thinking about consumers. So could you talk to us about that, about some of those changing interactions or definitions of how experts and and the regulatory regime are approaching consumers as a as a whole? Yeah, one of the book themes is is how do experts imagine consumers? And this started partly as a self chastisement. I was I was in the early phase of this, I would be sort of learning about food labeling policies. And then I would sort of be writing and making claims about consumers and say, oh, now you have this and consumers doing this. Um, And colleagues would push back. They're like, well, how do you know? You need to go and find out how consumers are actually looking at this label. Uh, And I could have tried to do that, but that would have been a completely different project. What I realized is that actually the story that I'm wanting to tell is how are these experts thinking about the consumer in a bunch of different ways. Um, Sometimes they're in these discussions making claims about consumers. And so the the phrase ordinary consumer comes out of uh, sort of legal discussions about the consumer expectations test. Um, And this is important because when you're setting legal standards and you wanna say, you know, what is fraud or deceit, you have to have in, in mind an idea what an ordinary consumer would be fooled by versus a very gullible consumer. And so you have these moments where uh, sort of legal scholars and lawyers are arguing that no, the ordinary consumer expects the food to look like this. Um, they know what this is. Um, however, as there is a shift towards away from the food standard system that I discussed in the first half of the book towards information labeling, uh, 
you can see policymakers starting to think about a different kind of consumer. The one who is seeking out information, um, maybe, maybe they have particular needs in mind for health reasons or for other lifestyle reasons. And, and so in the book, I call this the informed consumer. In the later chapters, I argue there are lots of other models of the consumer. So I, I describe it as a kind of progression, but in reality, it's more cyclical. You have these kind of cycles of how advertisers, policymakers, um, and nutrition scientists are imagining consumers. Um, and so in later chapters, uh, you can see a kind of late 80s, 90s awareness that the same person is different in different contexts. Uh, and that really shapes how the nutrition facts label is designed because it's this weird mix of different kinds of potential consumer interests that the same consumer might have. Like uh, she as a mother might be interested in her children and therefore looking at the vitamins. Um, but then as a uh, woman cooking for her husband, she might be concerned about heart disease. And so I describe this, uh, I draw on an idea from a STS scholar, uh, Sherry Turkle of the distributed self. And I say it's the distributed consumer, this person who's, um, a different person in different kinds of contexts. The other kind of one that has really dominated conversation in the last 20 years is the irrationally or the rationally irrational consumer. And this is really popular in behavioral economics, where this idea that we're not making rational calculations as consumers, we're motivated by emotional or rational concerns, but they have patterns and advertisers or policymakers can nudge and steer consumers taking advantage of these kinds of uh, patterns or habits and the irrational consumers, you know, desires. Um, I think this might be the moment to talk about the very different, the different kinds of labels that you talk about in your book. I mean, it's really fascinated that there are also these other kinds of labels and um, I wondered whether you could also explain how these different kinds of labels imagine consumers or try to influence consumer or market behavior in different ways. And, uh, and I'll just tack on a little risk question to the end of this, which is to say, Excellent. are any of them like the failure, the kind of labels you see on consumer products that are about, you know, failure to warn? Or is food just different than like lawnmowers is one of the examples I use in my yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I do think that food is different from other products um, as a kind of risk concern. But let me start by thinking about the different kinds of labels I talk about in the book. Um, one of the things that I, the, 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 the subtitle of the book says in the information age, um, and for me, I, I actually follow a lot of historians and taking that back way before the 1990s and the internet. Um, so I actually think the first informational moment for the FDA is with the food standards. Um, and in, when they're developing these food standards, which are called standards of identity, the idea is that the, the identity, the name is linked to a, a set standard kind of recipe where you have, you know, accepted ingredients, ranges of ingredients, uh, processes used to make the food. So like if it's tomato soup, then that would be, there'd be kind of a range that companies who make tomato soup could follow uh, and have their own specific recipe. And this is actually a kind of informational term because, but what they're trying to do is reduce the information to just the name and standardize the food to fit that. Um, and this is important in terms of labeling because then there's all kinds of information they try to keep off the label. Um, they're trying to build up more complicated labeling rules around drugs and particularly prescription drugs. Um, by the late 1960s, they're even struggling with um, uh, prescription inserts, uh, pres or, sorry, prescription patient inserts, where they're recognizing maybe the patients need to have information independent of their doctors. Uh, this is a big concern for. Uh, controversial lifestyle drugs like birth control, where there's a lot of angry people about who think that doctors and the FDA don't aren't considering women's risks um, and and needs with the concerns of birth control. So 
in drugs, there is this kind of long story of the FDA trying to think about how to do labeling. But with food, they kind of want to do the opposite. For, a, for several decades, they want to keep health stuff off. They're trying to fight a campaign against nutrition quackery. And so even though they're not using information labels, they have a kind of idea about what the label is supposed to do. That From the 1970s to the present, you get a kind of expansion of information labeling, first with the nutrition inf information label in the 1970s. And this is different than nutrition facts because it was considered to be voluntary. So it wasn't required in all food products. But if a company wanted to market a health food or make some kind of health statement on their food, then they had to have it. So it was a kind of uh, a regulation through the market, right? You're allowed to innovate and create new health foods, but then you have to carry this kind of disclaimer nutrition information that balances that information out. Uh, other kind of food labels that I talk about in the book, particularly in later chapters, um, you have a, a rising interest in definitely what I, I call risk labels, the concerns. Um, California has Proposition 65 and any kind of potentially carcinogenic food would have to carry the California Proposition 65 label. There's a lot of debates in industry about this. Um, genetically modified food labels um, also work as a kind of risk label um, because consumers perceive it to be a different kind of food. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you were trying to get me at in terms of thinking about different sorts of labels. Yeah, uh, but I was also thinking about who reads labels. The most zealous uh, label reader I know is uh, celiac, who <clears throat> will be deathly ill if she gets any wheat gluten. And she it's hereditary in her family. So this is part of the family culture is standing in the grocery store reading ingredient lists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so for her, the most important label on food is not the nutrition facts. It's the ingredient list. Right. Um, I also know a diabetic for whom the calorie, the carbohydrate count is the crucial piece of information. Now, whether or not, so I guess part of the question is also for people like that is mislabeling um, grounds for tort. Okay. Uh, or, yeah. You know, so three nuts is the. So, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll answer with sort of three answers. So, first of all, when I was interviewing um, the head of um, CIFSAN, the Center for Food Safety and Nutrition at FDA in the 1990s, he was retired by then. Um, and I asked him, I was I was managing, I was trying to get him to say, who are you? Who are you thinking of in terms of consumers? He said that they kind of thought about there being three consumers groups when they were developing the label. And he said, you know, one group, you could think of them as sort of information seekers. And he's like, if you put this information under a rock on a hill in a forest, they will find it. Like they're going to try to find this information. They're highly motivated to get the information about the food. And he's like, actually the nutrition facts label wasn't intended for them per se, because in a way, um, it might make it easier for them to get some of this information, but they're going to find the information anyway. And so there was this kind of active information seeking consumer. Yeah, at the other extreme, they imagined consumers who were just never going to read it and never care about nutrition information. So for them, the, the focus of the nutrition facts label was the middle cons type of consumer who, if we made it easier for them to get the information, they might take an interest. Um, and so you're right that I think when these labels are being designed, there are different kinds of users and industry especially is aware of this, but even the FDA, uh, that's shaping how they think about it. In terms of tort liability, um, if you if you make a patently false claim or if you, um, you know, if you mislabel, um, the FDA could litigate you. Uh, it, it's more common in the last 50 years that other industry actors would um, take you to court if they thought it was creating an unfair competition with them. Um, the FDA was much more active litigating misbranding cases from the sort of 40s to the 60s. Since the 70s, it's been more focused on pharmaceuticals than it has on food. Um, there are exceptions to that where they sort of decide we're going to make an example of this sort of bad case to send a signal to the industry that they're on, on notice. Um, 
And then the sort of last comment I'll make is specific to your discussion about allergies. In the book, I talk a little bit about allergies, but I don't talk much because a lot of the push for labeling with allergies starts in the 1990s and really culminates in the 2000s. So towards the end of what I'm talking about, um, where it is important is it's a good example among people who are looking at food labeling and risk of the danger of overwarning. And so there's oh. good legal articles where they talk about this, where um, may contain peanuts has become an almost meaningless label um, because for liability purposes, everyone just puts it on the package without actually taking the time to ask whether it's a plausible concern. Um, and so if you're someone who has to avoid the, that allergen, a wide range of products are now unavailable to you that might not that, that might not be, you know, it might not be correct for that to happen. And so there are lots of discussions among um, sort of uh, lawyers about, and also at the FDA periodically about whether they need to push the industry to be more careful about how they use those kinds of uh, warning labels. Yeah. Thank you. I think this is a good, this may also be a good point. Uh, there's so many uh, so many things I've been jotting down, Zach, you know, that are really interesting that you're saying. One of the things that you mentioned is, um, I think you you kind of mentioned it in passing, but it's something that is a thread that's sort of woven through the book is, is uh, you called it nutritional quackery, right? Mm. And this idea of, of mislabeling um, of, of the kind of um, the regulatory power of the FDA to, to control what kinds of claims are being made um, for, for food items. And I think that relates a lot to something I'm really interested in, which is a theme of trust. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wondered th this is this idea of trust and the regulatory state and, and it's role in quote unquote, protecting consumers or the expectation that the regulatory state is going to protect consumers. Um, that, that plays into our understandings of trust in the market. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how you see that coming through in your book. Yes, absolutely. And one reason I'm excited about you talking with me about this book is that our work share an interest in this question about trust and in your work branding, um, but even something like food standards emerged as the FDA's solution to this problem of how you can convince consumers to trust the food supply. Um, and in some ways it happened in dialogue with similar uh, challenges that industry was having of how do they brand their nationally uh, marketed packaged foods. Um, yeah. One of the ways I tell the story of trust um, you may challenge uh, in your book, you kind of challenge this, um, but is you have a moment in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century where uh, more important people are in consumer are in urban environments. Um, initially they're buying uh they're not buying it in bulk in, in, in the sense of large quantities, but they're buying a lot of their food unpackaged um, in grocers markets um, or from sort of uh, milkmen and other kinds of uh, producers. And by the 1930s, a lot more of their food is uh, being purchased in a packaged form. And so I open my book with what I say is sort of this packaging revolution that's taking place. Um, that can be traced to the 1800s, but it's sort of another level by the 1930s. And, um, and one of the reasons why uh, consumer advocates um, and regulators become concerned in the 1930s about the need for standards, is, for federally set st uh, standards, is because they're concerned about all of this kind of trickery and fraud happening with packaged foods. Um, so I say that there's this different kind of relationship that the consumer has um, with the producer when it's happening through this media of the package instead of the kind of interpersonal relationship of buying from a local shop person that they know. And most people in the 1930s are still buying in their, in their local neighborhood from a shop person that they know, a grocer who, that, who they might even buying on credit. Um, but that's the kind of market context where you have a push for a new uh, type of regulation. Um, and, and actually, after the book, I've started to get more interested now in this idea of packaging. How are packages used to, to solve problems of trust, but also solve a lot of other business problems um, in terms of logistics, environmental costs, and things like that. Um, and 
one of the answers was that from consumer advocates in the 30s was we need to set clear standards. In a way, they were arguing that actually businesses would be would benefit from this too, that they're already doing it <laughs> for a reason, but we need to then think about consumer interest in that conversation, and that would bring the FDA in. Um, I think the reason why the, the government gets invited into this process a lot of times is sort of because business interests fail to do it all themselves. And so one of the challenges I have when I narrate the story is how much is there a kind of antagonism between the government and industry, which is often what you see in the kind of public facing literature as if somehow industry is resisting and the government is pushing um, and how much there's what, what I, in the book I talk about and other scholars have called co-regulation where um, in a way, big industry players and the FDA have a, a shared interest in reputation management, right? Um, industry is trying to, to build trust in the reputation of mass marketed foods. And the FDA is also concerned about building trust that the mass markets of foods are safe and reliable. I feel like I could keep talking, but I'm going to pause for a second and see if I'm not losing the thread I'm, of the, the question. I'm going to, um, if you don't mind, also ask a question. Um, also to say that uh, I think children are the new consumers that you might be looking for. My child, because he's got this... Um, he gets a lot of cavities. He just constantly looks at the added sugar and he uh, brings it to me yeah. and says, well, I can eat this, man. <laughs> so it's yeah. good for him that he's got that label. Um, my question was about the logistics and apparatus behind making uh, and putting these labels in the packages. Is it mm. When does it become integrated in the kind of in the, in the enterprise, right? In the food enterprise, this, are there specialists within the, in the firm that only do that? <laughs> and, and when does that happen? And um, and also, if you can give me like a very basic, like for someone that doesn't know, how does it work? Is the food first prepare and then it goes through a um, like a control, quality control um, section where they give the... Um, the label, the information for the label, and then... <laughs> yeah, G good question. And, and I learned about this when I was digging into the nutrition facts label, because one of the subplots in the 1990s was logistically, how are companies that had not had a nutrition label now suddenly going to come up with that profile? And um, most companies had two different approaches to that. Um, if you're one of the big companies... Um, General Mills, um, you know, and, and Kellogg's and, and these kind of big companies that have lots of different products, you would have an in-house nutrition division. Um, they would, there was the, an association, um, let's see, the Association of Organic and Analytic Chemists. It had other names in the past, like agricultural chemists. It's a, you know, 130 year old organization of people who are interested in analytic chemistry related to food and agricultural questions. And they held special sessions to talk about how do we um, standardize methods for the wide variety of food products. Um, they even created, I wanted to get this in the book, but I thought it would be a little too much of a dive into the science. They even created what they called the food triangle matrix, which was a, a triangle where they placed different categories of foods based on wetness, dryness, because you'd use different analytic chemistry, analytic chemist tests, depending on that. And then also mostly uh, protein, mostly carbohydrate, or mostly um, fatty, because that also changes the kinds of tests used. So there are a lot of these conversations about um, what you would do for that. If you were a big company, you might have that in-house because you're creating a lot of products and it'd be worth paying people to generate those profiles. If you were a smaller company, there are a lot of um, private laboratories um, that offered the service and they were, they were advertising heavily in, in, in food industry during the nineties saying, Hey, send your food to us. We'll provide you an analytic test of your product. Um, getting to question about when, where does that fit into the food company's business strategy? Um, the answer is very early. In other words, uh, one of the arguments I make in this book is that food companies are designing their food products with the label in mind. 
because it's going to shape how, especially from the 1970s forward, um, they're talking with their marketing teams to try to think about like what, what do people care about? And then they're working back from that to think about how to formulate the foods. Um, so um, that is one reason why, you know, if you're creating processed foods, labeling changes about nutrition in a way don't are not as hard for you to meet as if you're a sort of traditional food maker making traditional food products. Um, it's going to be a lot harder for you to rework your, your production system to kind of benefit from the new health messaging on it. Um, the other thing that happens at, later in the 1990s uh, in this, in terms of what's that, what they do today, um, a lot of companies started, the industry created a kind of nutrition database for food. And if you're designing some kind of chip and you're just changing the kind of spice flavor of it or just modifying the formula a bit, you don't actually necessarily have to run an entire new test on the food product. You can kind of draw from the database the older product and then know how you changed it and then sort of change the nutrition label okay, accordingly. So that so for these processed foods, um, it's become very mechanical how they how they do that. I should just say something thinking about your, your, your son. One of the challenges I have, uh, one of the readerships that I like to, to push for this book are people who work in nutrition, science, and education. I think there's a lot of interesting sort of history of changing diet concerns for them. Um, one of the reasons I don't tell this is a kind of celebration narrative of we got more information, now we're better off is because I actually think nutrition labeling has become very problematic. Um, in my own teaching, I feel like my students uh, in the United States have, it, have really internalized a strong American healthist ideology of their food. Um, I'll have students who are, I'll, I'll have them do a kind of exercise where they share their, their food diet for the last week and we do a show and tell and they'll introduce a food that was their special food for the week and they'll kind of apologize to the class because it's like fried chicken. You know, that was there. Were, they, I was telling like, say a special meal you had and they'll say, oh, I had this fried chicken. And then they'll kind of apologize um, because they know it's bad for you. And one of the things in the book I'm trying to sort of argue is that actually food is doing a lot of different things. Um, when expert communities foreground nutrition and health, um, they're making a real value decision about how you think about food. Um, and even though nutrition facts look like an objective way to talk about food, actually we read it as consumers very emotionally. Like, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? And morally. Um, and so I, I kind of make an argument to be careful about getting pulled into that healthist view of, of food. The other thing is that it's individualizing. It puts the burden on the consumer to make those responsible choices instead of being the responsibility of these bigger actors who are creating our food, you know, landscapes. Yeah. And I think, I think Zach, I, I, that was a question that I was going to ask and I'm glad that you introduced it because when you were talking about the different kinds of consumers and, and the interview that you had with the, the gentleman who was you know formerly in, in charge at the FDA or, or a, a higher up at the FDA, you said they were aiming for the middle, right? The people, there were people who were going to find the information no matter what, and there were people who didn't care no matter what, but the people in the middle who might be influenced. And I think one thing you didn't say, which I feel that is implied in the book, is that there's a, a sort of assumption or an attempt to influence people to make quote unquote healthier choices, Right. Mm -hmm. That if the information is sort of like front and center on the label, that the person might make a, a quote unquote healthier choice. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you that you brought that up. And I think um, just a very quick follow up, because I, I want to give Arwen a chance to, to ask another question as well. But mm -hmm. um, but thinking about the failures of the system. Right. I don't know if it's too presentist to mention what's been in the news recently. There's been a, a, a recent recall of children's applesauce products because mm -hmm. of, of, of lead poisoning. Right. And 
And I've, I've, this as a parent, this is very concerning to me. Right. And I've been reading up on it and, and it's really exposed to me as a consumer, the limitations of the FDA's sort of reach and the regulatory state. And so I guess I would just ask you uh, if you could, if you have any thoughts to share about that, that kind of navigating the failures um, in regulation and how does that impact the consumer mindset or the consumer market? Yeah, I yeah, I often try to talk about the book in a way that I think is accessible to non-scholars, but for, you know, for a moment, I think it's actually worth pointing out something for the business history community. One of the kind of, if I, if you're sticking this book in a genre of business history, it is very much a story of um, an older market regulatory environment where you have um, New Deal institutions regulating standards. Um, the the mode of the of the state there is an activist state, um, litigating bad actors, um, you know, creating active food standards, you know, in the interest of the consumer, at least in theory. Um, and then you have a change in the 1970s. This will be very familiar to business historians today, where you start getting the dismantling of that older system and in place something new. And the new here is, um, you know, information regulation in the market. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I don't think I use the word neoliberal much in the book um, because it, that carries a lot of baggage, um, but it's definitely a story of responsibili- responsibilization of the individual, right? You, uh, the idea is now, instead of the FDA making decisions about what's good or bad foods in the standards, it's like, we're putting that on the label and that falls on you. And some of the problems I see today reflect the kind of momentum that has been gained on that policy approach, where um, third-party certifications for all kinds of ethical concerns about food, risk labels about food, put the the parents, since we're all talking about parents, I'm also a parent, put the, put the parent in the position of deciding risks instead of foregrounding the importance of having public institutions um, or expert communities uh, make decisions about what is acceptable, what is not, um, and use their organizational power um, to do something about that. So one of the reasons why the book is not a celebration of this informational turn and this rise of food labeling is because I see that as a kind of negative consequence. The, the FDA, I say at one point in the book, has become an information broker instead of you know, an activist state trying to protect the consumer. And it's an information broker in a big economy of information. So it, it sort of downgrades the role of the FDA. Uh, the other thing that I don't say enough in the book, but when I've been asked now in terms of policy engagement on the book, I, I, I emphasize is that the FDA um, has not been given resources and staffing since the 1980s um, for the work it has. And that means that a lot of what it's doing is sending signals into the market because it doesn't have the staff to, to actively police and pursue bad actors. Um, and so I think some of the story we're hearing now about the lead and the applesauce, um, not just the FDA, also at the state and local level, um, reflects that kind of decades long attrition in those communities. I, for the bigger picture of the book, one of the things I, I'm, I wrote the book speaking to food studies people, and I have this whole argument about how experts are really important. And part of that is to say that um, they're playing this huge role in shaping these kinds of everyday environments. I focus on these three communities of sort of business experts in terms of advertisers um, and consumer experts, science experts in terms of food scientists, nutrition scientists, and um, legal experts in terms of the FDA and also um, sort of legal scholars and lawyers, but there are many others. But one of the ironies that I say at the end of the book is that um, labels give this idea that we have all this, we're empowered to make choices, but actually even those choices are being framed and shaped by these experts. So we're even more dependent on them with these informa- informative labels to be making decisions about what goes on the label and what, what doesn't. Well, I have a little question which may help to sort of tie a bow around this a little bit. Um, 
Can you tell us about something that you learned in writing this book that really surprised you or something that you believe going in that turned out to not be the case at all? Uh, well, let's see. The first, the first story that comes to mind was when I was interviewing uh, Berkey Belser. Um, unlike Jen, I did not have much of a design or visual arts background, visual media conception of this project when I was doing this interview. And Berkey Belser was the head of a design firm that in 1992, the FDA hired to work on the nutrition facts label. And He's widely spread it. He just passed away a year ago and he's wi widely celebrated as sort of the designer of that label. So the kind of simple black and white format, um, the use of Helvetica and all these other kinds of design choices um, is credited to him and his firm. And when he was talking to me, he was trying to emphasize, he even called it a, a government brand and they later hired him uh, his firm to work on a drugs facts label, which has a similar kind of design. And he described that as extending the brand. So you can, you know, he has this very market kind of talk in that sense about it. But one of the things he said was that when the nutrition facts label appeared on all products everywhere, it, he said it supersedes reading. And, he, and I remember in the quote, he said something like, it, you know, you see it over and over and over and over again. It starts to have a kind of effect like, you know, scholars would call this like hegemonic effect, right? A kind of power that goes beyond just reading and persuasion. Um, and since then, the more I think about it, the more I realize this, this idea that even a kind of rational objective tool like the nutrition facts label um, is being used emotionally by the consumer. And I, and I, the more I think about that, the more that affects how I talk to the FDA when I'm trying to say, you know, listen about your sort of very narrow focused rules about um, front of packaging label, for example, um, you're focused on nutrients, but consumers are not just thinking nutrients. They're thinking a lot of other stuff. Um, and that's because they have a much bigger project in mind than just balancing out their nutrients for the day. Um, food is doing a lot more for them. So I think that was kind of something that I, I that, you know, when I was starting this project, I wasn't as conscious about. And now thinking about how labels are this emotional moral tool is really key. Business historians might find this surprising because in marketing, you know, there's all these different types of marketing and advertising. And one of those is the emotive appeal. And um, so it's very, it's much more obvious from sort of the, the private branding exercise than this public branding. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're gonna start wrapping up the interview. And the last question would be, what are you working on now, Zach? Yeah, I have, I have two projects I'm exploring. Um, one is uh, this packaging project that I got interested in um, that I am trying to see if I can expand it. Um, when I was looking at sort of thinking about the food label in the 1930s um, and why we didn't get a federal informative, uh, federal law pushing informative labels. One of the things I, I, I ran across was a lot of interesting packaging industry advertisements to food companies saying, hey, look at all these new packaging materials we have. Um, and so I started think, looking at the packaging industries to see how they're advertising over the decades to food to meet food industry needs. Um, and so one of the projects I'm interested in is I see it as a kind of prehistory to our current interest in the circular economy. Um, as environmentalism has gotten really big, a lot of companies today are really interested in, you know, how do you reduce the footprint by changing your strategies on packaging? And there's all these compromises with that because packages are great for convenience. They can even be great for safety and health. And yet they're a disaster for the environment. But actually, companies were concerned about this for decades. Um, they weren't doing it for environmental reasons. They were doing it for logistical costs uh, and energy cost um, reasons. And so one of the things I want to do is sort of tell a prehistory of our current interest. Um, the best example I have of this, but I haven't yet secured good archives for this, is Coca-Cola. Um, because its entire business model is centered around, um, in, the, in the 30s, not handling bottling. <laughs> 
um, just being the formula, using the trademark, right, to protect and, and trade secrets to protect its product, but then outsourcing the packaging questions to the bottlers. In the 60s, uh, with the rise of PET uh, plastics, they start exploring the idea of plastic bottles and bringing the bottling back in-house. But one of the things they're concerned about is the energy and, and material cost of that. Um, and that actually, they solicit a, um, a, a private company to do a, an, an analysis of this. And that's one of the two studies that is considered the origin of the life cycle uh, assessment, life cycle assessment analysis. Um, so very big LCA, very big technique used today for environmental purposes that has this older sort of business history to it. The other project I'm interested in is, I see it as a pivot away from food and uh, food labeling and packaging is the Mediterranean diet um, and how it gets uh, sort of rediscovered or invented, depending on how you see it after World War II by an American interested in sort of promoting what he sees as a healthy lifestyle um, through Mediterranean foods. And then it turns into this just business enterprise. It's a huge, big business today. And so sort of tracing how it goes from being a public health thing to a uh, sort of marketing opportunity for you know olive oil to being this big diet literature today, I think is a, an interesting story. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Arwin and Jen, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, thank you to our audience uh, who tuned in today. This interview will be available as a podcast and a video on the BHC's YouTube channel. For more interviews like this, actually with Jennifer Black next time, uh, please visit the BHC website, the